it happened again this morning. I was in an airport heading home, and somebody who I didn't know at all, complete stranger, came up to me, as if we had been in a conversation for a very long time, as if we knew each other, and asked me a question. He said, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? It's not the first person who came up to me, who I didn't know, who said, what are we going to do? Maybe it's because I'm, I'm short and conspicuous, or people have seen my face. Uh, I don't have the answer. And I said to him, again, this is somebody I've never seen before, I don't know. But what struck me about that question that is asked me over and over again, what are we going to do by complete strangers in airports and elsewhere, is it conveys a sense of powerlessness, a, con a sense that people have, and I feel it and see it all over this country as I travel all over this country, that they feel that they have no efficacy, no ability to influence anything that is, that is facing their lives. Uh, as workers, uh, many of them are in companies where they feel that they are not listened to, they don't have a voice. Uh, management can do whatever it wants. Uh, they are insignificant, they are invisible. As consumers, uh, they try to deal with the phone company or uh, the bank or the insurance company or whatever, and they can't find anybody uh, to, to help them to deal with their problems. They're, they're, they're buried in, in, in kind of call menus, uh, or they just can't find the right person. But most significantly, as citizens, as, as voters, as participants in our democracy, they feel that they don't have a voice. They feel that big money has taken over everything. Uh, they feel a sense of hopelessness about our democracy, about our politics. And that sense of powerlessness and hopelessness is a self-fulfilling prophecy, because if you feel uh, that there is no way of changing anything, then nothing will change. The good news is that we are a majority. We who feel the sense of powerlessness are just like millions and millions of other people who also feel that they are powerless. And if we can get together, if we can come together and express our views, whether as employees or as consumers or most importantly as citizens, as voters, we can actually gain power. As participants in this democracy, we can take our democracy back. We can take our economy back. The good news is we have the numbers. What's stopping us is that we have no vehicle for coming together. We don't have political parties the way we once had political parties that were based at the grassroots and at the state level. Most political parties these days are just fun, big fundraising machines. We don't have unions, labor unions, for people to come together for collective bargaining. Uh, we do, but a very small percentage of Americans are unionized. Uh, as consumers, we are up against big conglomerations of, of economic power. Uh, we used to have competition, but if you look at airlines or internet services or insurance and big insurance or big pharmaceuticals or the biggest banks, uh, there is little, little or no competition. But we can get competition if we insist on it, if we come together as citizens and say antitrust enforcement is critical. Do you get my drift here? I can't tell you actually how exactly we are going to come together, but my optimism is based on the notion that we can, and we must, and we will. Now, there are three moral principles that bind us together in terms of our economy. And they bind us together because most people actually agree with those principles. We disagree on how to achieve them, maybe, but at least if we can come together and agree that we agree, that's the basis of the conversation. Principle number one is that nobody should be working full-time and still be in poverty, or their family in poverty. All full-time workers should be out of poverty. 
This is a principle that, by polls, by focus groups, by every other means that we have to tell public opinion, the vast majority, 80, 90 percent of Americans, agree on. How do we achieve that? How do we make sure that nobody is working full-time and still in poverty? Well, one, we raise the minimum wage. Number two, we expand something called the Earned Income Tax Credit, which is a wage subsidy. Number three, we make sure that if the earned income tax credit and a minimum wage are not adequate, we at least provide people with enough food stamps or other assistance or a basic universal income when all else fails so that nobody is working full time and in poverty. Second principle that everybody agrees on, again, we have disagreements about how to get there, but we agree that everyone should be able to make the most of their native abilities, their God-given talents, their capacities. How do we do that? Well, we do it through not only early childhood education, if we can afford that, but we must afford it. We know that that's a critical investment in making sure that young minds are stimulated enough that they can reach their potential. We do it through a K-12 through educational system that works. Now, we have debates about how it should be organized, whether it should be vouchers, or whether we should pay teachers more, or whether we should have a lot of tests. Personally, I think we're testing too much. But the notion is that we have this fundamental moral ideal that everybody should be able to make it. We can debate the details, gather evidence, figure out what works, get rid of what doesn't work, but at least let's come together around the basic idea and ideal. And then the third moral principle of the economy is that we should not have a privileged aristocracy. Even our founding fathers understood this. In fact, this was a basic principle at the time of the revolution. That's why we actually created a government we have. We don't want an economy that generates the kind of fortunes that represented the 19th, 18th, 17th century Britain. The kind of fortunes that move from generation to generation to generation. That's why we need an estate tax, an inheritance tax, that prevents that kind of inherited wealth from taking over. That's why we need to bust up the biggest banks and other large concentrations of income and wealth and power in our society, why we have antitrust laws. It's also why we have to put some constraints on political spending. We need campaign finance reform. We need full disclosure of who is financing whom. And we need to reverse that abominable Supreme Court case, Citizens United, so that we understand that the First Amendment does not require that corporations be considered people and does not consider money to be speech, so that we can limit the amount of money that is distorting and undermining and corroding our democratic system. Do you get my drift? There are these three very large central moral ideals that we have in common. Not everybody agrees to all of them, but they are majorities. We have the power to try what is required to implement these principles. Where do we begin? Where do you begin? You don't wait for the ideal political candidate. You don't wait for the savior. You yourself call up your friends, your neighbors, get together in your living room, talk about your own community, where you as a community fail with regard to these three basic principles. Talk about what can be done in your community, in your state, with regard to effectuating these ideals. Get together with other people outside your bubble. They may disagree with you. They may be called uh, a different political party, or they may be, if you're a conservative, they may be liberals. It doesn't matter. Put those labels away. Get together with people who may call themselves something else, but who subscribe to the same fundamental ideals. Talk to them. Create an organization. Build that organization. Build a movement. We're seeing the beginnings of this 
kind of movement already, the movement toward raising the minimum wage, the fight for $15. Walmart workers, McDonald's workers. We're seeing people rise up against the Trans-Pacific Partnership from the grassroots saying, no, that kind of trade agreement is bad. We don't want that. You see, we have the elements here of a movement to take back our democracy, to take back our economy, and we can do it. The leader that you've been waiting for is you. Start now.